Quatrième et dernière conférence de cette matinée et on parlera de l'impact de l'intelligence artificielle, de l'apprentissage automatique hein, sur la promotion de l'innovation et de la technologie dans les entreprises, euh, donc centré essentiellement sur, euh, sur les données. Et pour cela, eh ben, un porte-drapeau, un ambassadeur tunisien qui fait notre fierté, il vient du Canada, plus précisément de l'université de Waterloo. Fahri Karay, bienvenue chez vous. Merci. Merci. Uh, first of all, excuse me, I would like to speak English uh, during uh, this talk, but uh, I promise you that it will be not uh, very boring. Uh, I would like to speak today, uh, and before I speak, I would like to thank the organizing committee for an excellent organization of this uh, event, and see uh, Nasser Kshaw and all his team have done an excellent job, and I was quite impressed with the, with the level of organization, so thank you very much for your efforts. Uh, what I'm going to speak today, and I changed the, the title a little bit, which is going to be on AI, the ultimate uh, tool for growth and competitiveness in the midst of the fourth industrial revolution. Indeed, what we are, what we are witnessing today, indeed, is the midst of the fourth industrial uh, revolution, and I will speak uh, very briefly about that in a few moments. Uh, I'm not an expert in the area of uh, smart uh, enterprise or smart businesses, but uh, I teach mainly artificial intelligence, intelligent systems, but I also interact with corporations, large and small, and uh, I give advice to a number of them in the fields of AI and how to implement AI, artificial intelligence, for various sectors, in the banking sector, in the insurance sector, in manufacturing, various type of areas, and I will speak about that shortly. So this is uh, the outline of my presentation. So I know that this is lunchtime, but I try to be brief and concise. And my predecessor in the presentation has given an excellent presentation on tools of machine learning and AI. Although I'm going to uh, give a little bit of uh, uh, insight on these tools, but uh, he has uh, presented excellent material and they have presented excellent material. So I will speak about the AI world landscape. I would like to give also an overview on AI and what we are talking today about AI and machine learning. What is the major growth that is witnessed today that is the fuel of this industrial revolution? I will chat also on the major impact on industries and businesses. Uh, my colleagues have also presented on that and how to catch up at the macro and micro levels, at the enterprise, the business level, and at the government uh, level as well. I will also speak about a business model at the University of Waterloo, where uh, we have uh, initiated a uh, research institute in the field of artificial intelligence. I will speak briefly about that and its impact on the local and the regional uh, infrastructure uh, we have uh, there in the area of uh, Toronto and in the province uh, of Ontario. And then I will conclude my remarks. Uh, this is a snapshot uh, taken uh, several months ago for one full day about the activity of machine learning around the world. And uh, the green denotes modest activity, the red denotes very high activity and as you can see various areas around the world have very high level activity of machine learning and this is the TensorFlow only so this is a platform that is known as TensorFlow and this is Google uh, has put this TensorFlow platform to be used I mean all over the world let's talk a little bit here about where we are now so we have three industrial revolutions over the past 200 years. One of them is mechanization and, uh, of production. The second one deal with mass production. The third one, automation uh, of production. And the fourth one, which is the integration of breakthrough enabling technologies that have appeared over the past 20 years, actually. 20 years, that's where the fourth industrial revolution is occurring. And uh, the big fuel, is the big data, AI, and machine learning. Uh, recent and future impact of AI and machine learning on businesses, industry, and society is predicted to surpass the impact of the various industrial revolutions combined. This is a big statement. 
But I promise you, this is not an overblown statement. The amount of effort and the amount of impact that is going to be due to this particular revolution is, has never been seen by human. And we are seeing it, I mean, in the form of uh, company, in the form of investment, as I'm going to mention in the next few slides, and the huge GDP growth that is going to be witnessed in the next 15 years. So this is the, what we call the fourth industrial revolution, which is fueled by big data, AI, and machine learning. Look at these particular statistics here that were provided by Deloitte and uh, PricewaterhouseCooper. And uh, these numbers are simply gigantic. So $15.7 trillion will be, I mean, are going to be contributed to the global GDP by 2030. This has never been thought, I mean, of only four, five years ago. When I used to give talks, I mean, four or five years ago, we were saying 500 billion to $1 trillion, the GDP, I mean, growth that is going to be witnessed uh, uh, by 2030. People are even saying that by 2027, this number is going to be reached. This is huge. This is incredible, and this is why people are saying this is uh, the uh, fourth uh, industrial revolution. Look at some of the major contributors here. So the total GDP is $15.7 trillion, but look at the major players. $7 trillion in China, $3.7 trillion in North America, $1.8 trillion in Northern Europe, and uh, $1.3 trillion for Africa and Oceania, and $0.9 trillion in the rest of Asia outside of China. So these numbers give us a prediction and where the growth is happening. And this type of numbers here are realistic. I mean, uh, as this particular figure shows, which is a bit uh, outdated, but the trend is almost similar. So there has been growth of these type of numbers. Now China is around $10 billion, if you look at it. And this has happened only over the past three years. So China is going to catch up with the rest of the world, and especially with the US, by 2025, and it's going to have larger investment and larger value, and uh, augmented value for, uh, for its industrial outputs by 2025. And they are working, and they are going to achieve this number according to the development that is happening now. We look here at some of the enabling technologies that are fueling the various type of industries. As you can see, the big data that is coming, I mean, the huge amount of data that is being collected from various type of industries. Some of these industries are related to some of these enabling technologies, such as smart robotics, Internet of Things, autonomous vehicles. As we speak now, there are, I mean, a huge amount of data that are being collected by companies that are using these enabling technologies. This big data is simply going to engines that are fueled by AI and machine learning, and I will come back to that later on. And the outcome of this AI and machine learning is going to close the loop and feed back all industries that are making use of these enabling technologies. So we have the glue of the enabling technology, which is big data, AI, and machine learning. We have the various type of, uh, we have the various type of enabling technologies, and of course we have industries that we are going to see here in this particular uh, slides. And uh, you can talk almost about every type of industry: transportation, manufacturing, healthcare. Uh, smart grid, almost every industry is being touched by the big data and implementation of big data to get decision-making process from this big data. So we are talking about the global industries and the global businesses, whether for medium-sized enterprise or large enterprise or corporation. Why this is happening now? There is a perfect storm that has happened over the past six to 10 years, only six to 10 years. And this perfect storm is the emergence of very powerful computing processor and a huge storage facility. That's one part. Tremendous amount of data that has been transmitted or streamed I mean, to people, to government, to offices, to institute, to academic, and this type of data is becoming suddenly available to the masses, to your researchers at various type of institutes. And of course, development of powerful and scalable algorithms and machine learning type of platforms. 
these things, I mean, have never occurred together. There was development of competition resources in the past, but this perfect storm, in the positive sense, has never occurred. It started to occur by 2010, 2012. And now we started reaping the benefits of this particular storm. And this is, I mean, historic uh, type of uh, growth in the area of artificial intelligence. So we start with the modern computing. I mean, in 1940, von Neumann, the sequential computer that we all use, the laptops, the, uh, the powerful PCs that we use in the office, and then the connectionist modeling, which is the emergence of what is known as artificial neural networks. They occurred by uh, uh, Frank Rosenblatt. He was one of the stars of this particular area. This particular area uh, was maintained for almost 10 years from the 1958 to 1970, and suddenly it has died out. Why it has died out? The neural network, which is now the fuel of the modern AI, has died out because at the time of 1958, 1960, 1970, there was no powerful computational resources and no cloud system that is able to process this amount of data. And then uh, from 1950s, 1970s, we have John McCarthy, who's the father of artificial intelligence, and the major development that has occurred in 1990, 1995, by a few pioneers. One of them is Schmiduber, and uh, there is Professor Hinton, there is uh, a number, uh, Benjiu, and uh, uh, colleagues and uh, students who have developed the notion of deep learning, which I'm going to speak about in a few moments. So what is the, I mean, AI? What is machine learning, deep learning? So my colleagues has fortunately spoke about that, so I'm not going to repeat that. But AI is an umbrella of uh, algorithms that try to automate intellectual tasks non normally performed by human. So this is the highest, the utopia of reaching the intelligence of human. So that's the AI. So that's the set of algorithms that have been started to be developed in the 50s, and they are being developed up to today. Machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. It's a set also of algorithms to discover data and patterns uh, for prediction and classification. And my colleagues just spoken about it for the area of regression and classification. And deep learning, which is the new it's not newborn, but it's the new vogue in the area of machine learning and the implementation of it, which is making this revolution possible. And the deep learning is a special type of machine learning involving hierarchical and multi-layer data representation. So this is basically the uh, schematic of things. So I took this picture from this uh, blocks. And as you can see, the highest level of the umbrella is artificial intelligence, and then you have, sorry, you have the machine learning, and then you have the deep learning, which is a subset of machine learning. But the major growth that is happening nowadays, which is fueling all these type of enabling technologies, is due to this deep learning, to the deep learning uh, achievements. So if we can look very briefly at the foundational AI, when we speak about AI, AI is a large set of tools that people have been utilizing over the past several years. And it includes machine learning, statistical learning, data mining. It includes probabilistic models, knowledge discovery. It can tackle also intelligent agents and game theory. Optimization and decision making are part of AI. Data science and data analytics. Affective computing and sentiment analysis. All of these are foundational aspects of AI. Operational AI, which is the applied aspect of the foundational AI, so it's the development of these type of tools that needs to be scalable, that need to be compact, that need to be secure, that need to be accessible, and they need to be dependable. And this is the implementation of all the tools that I have just mentioned uh, in the previous type of slides. So these slides are coming from my institute, which is uh, called waterloo.ai, for which I am directing. Very, very brief on the machine learning, so my colleague just spoke about that, so I will go very quickly on this. So the idea is to get some amount of data using an engine, which is a machine learning based system, recognize the pattern, build a model, okay? And then once you tune up the model, 
use that model for the new data that the system has not seen before. And as it was mentioned in the earlier presentation, if you are trying to model the, um, the obstacle avoidance system for an autonomous car using all engineers around the world, that is a reality indeed. We cannot do that using the sequential type of programming. However, using machine learning, this is becoming possible because machine learning deals with data and it creates models that we are not able to enumerate. So these type of models are within a particular envelope of a super model, if you would like to call it. And uh, this is basically a connections model. This is where most of the latest type of technologies in the field of deep learning is happening. So you have a whole set of training data here of images of animals or cats, and then you have a connections type of model here that is utilizing a deep learning type of procedure, and then the system is going to extract, I mean, automatically these type of features, and then build them together to give you later on, uh, whether it's a dog, whether it's a cat, or another type of animal. So the system is able to classify them into various type of categories, provided that you are providing it with a huge amount of data here. And then the system is going to be utilized as a model and it is going to be deployed. Now, once this model has been tested and validated, then you are going to deploy it and you bring it a picture and then the system is able to recognize that picture and it tells you that this is a cat, sitting cat, standing cat. So every part of the system, I mean, uh, a position of a cat could be, I mean, uh, classified there. So this is the difference between machine learning or connections type of modeling and deep learning. And the secret is mostly in this particular area, which is the feature extraction. So the system, instead of having the human to extract the feature or to design them from experience, the system is going to automate this particular feature extraction. And this has been one of the major issues why the area of deep learning hasn't been deployed and hasn't been automated over the past several years. It was discovered in the 90s, in the mid-90s, but only in the early 2000, 2010, that it has started to, uh, to be implemented. So this is an example for, I mean, a connections model to classify a car. It's the automation process. There are other type of aspects, which is dealing with the overfitting, and there are a lot of uh, applications or, I mean, other features of deep learning that we are not able to, to speak uh, about them today. So what we hear about achievement of AIs nowadays, whatever you see in journals, in magazines, is mostly deep learning breakthroughs. That's what it is, mostly. Whether it's in computer vision, whether it's in speech recognition, whether it's in translation, Google translation, or any other type of translation, any type of classifier you can think of, the various ones are based on deep learning breakthrough. So you can put it as 65%, and the remainder is other type of approaches that has also seen some development in recent years. These are some of the major industries that have benefited, and they are benefiting today. And I am almost interacting with these uh, industries. Being the director of the institute, we received a lot of funding from many of these type of companies and industries. Some of them are small companies, some of them are large corporations, some of the biggest banks, some of the biggest insurance in North America. And each one of them has benefited from this particular revolution. So we see what they are doing. And some of the big players in the field of insurance, transportation, now are hiring in the hundreds, hundreds of people in the field of data analytics and machine intelligence and AI, literally. So this is where the revolution, that's why I'm telling you revolution. So uh, in the talk given by the largest uh, insurance company in uh, Canada and one of the largest in North America, the insurance company, they provided us with some statistics that it was uh, unbelievable. They said that they have created, I mean, over the past two years, a department in the field of AI, they have recruited them from all over the world with 400 people. It did not exist two years ago. So now 400 people. And they have, I mean, uh, stopped or uh, uh, slowed down the funding of other type of departments in order to have budget for these type of things. The same thing is happening in the banking sector, the same thing in the transportation sector. So why the major benefits to businesses and the society? So 
my friends and my colleagues have enumerated them earlier, but uh, innovative technology have the potential to improve the quality of life of individuals with access to the digital world. So anyone who has access to the internet has access to these type of uh, enabling type of technologies and to platforms in AI and machine learning. Anyone can have that. Spin-off technologies made it easier for consumers to increase the efficiency and pleasures of our personal lives. You can see a lot of the applications that we are using today are based on machine learning. Translation, machine vision, uh, interaction, human-machine interaction with speech. All of them are based on technologies that have seen the light over the past few years. Long-term gains in efficiency and the productivity for small, medium, and large businesses. This has been shown over and over again by major companies over the past few years. Transportation will become safer and friendly for the environment. Communicate why? Because traffic uh, time waiting I mean, is going to be minimized and the environment is going to benefit. Communications cost will drop. Logistics and global supply chain become more effective. Cost of trade will diminish that's opening new markets and driving economic growth. And that's the economic growth that we mentioned a few moments ago. So the AI revolution has the potential of affecting positively almost every sector of the industry and benefiting major portion of the humanity. And this is not talk. This is reality. I mean, from statistics that I am seeing every day. Of course, there are a lot of challenges. There were companies that do not have a lot of resources, are not able to compete and put together this research center or this development center, but this is happening as well in this particular areas. So uh, case in point, smart mobility, talking about connected vehicle, driverless autonomous cars, smart highway and ADA, advanced driver assistance systems. So these are utilizing most of them deep learning type of algorithms for machine vision, for connecting with other type of cars, for communicating with other systems or with the base station. All of it is happening now and these type of technologies have matured and over the past five years almost uh, 45 billion dollars companies spin-off companies have been sold 10 to 12 from all over the world to the major car manufacturers to create this type of technology and these type of companies have started only five to six years ago you can see the smart city that my colleagues also has mentioned smart and connected vehicles are going to make life much better for a number of cities that are being built now. They are being built now, these type of cities around the world. There are almost 12 smart cities that are being built and one or two are already in operation in various areas of the world, especially in Southeast Asia. Uh, AI in medicine is making also a revolution in terms of diagnosis of disease, in terms of connection through wearables of patients that are staying at home or elderly that are staying at home instead of going to the hospital. They are communicating almost instantly with their doctors, with their physicians in order for them to see whether they have a certain sort of emergency type of uh, situation, if they have to go to the hospital or not. And emergency, helicopters, all of them are becoming connected to customers. And this is our pilot projects that are in action now, at least in 10 to 12 cities around the world. And I'm involved in at least two of these major projects with Harvard University and with, uh, with Porto University in Portugal. Image recognition has been transformed literally since 2010, where the error rate recognition for images has gone from 25 to 30% to almost 2%. Basically, a system, computer vision system, well-trained, can recognize up to 98% of the images that have been provided to it in various type of configuration of objects, even for moving type of objects. This has happened over the past nine years only. How to catch up with the leaders in the field? So leaders in the field now are there. So as I mentioned to you, and we cannot hide it, North America, China are the leaders in the field. Why? simply because five or six of the top companies in China and in the US have market value of more than six trillion dollars. When you look at Amazon, when you look at Facebook, when you look at Google, at Microsoft, these type of companies, I mean, each one of them almost has a market value more than one trillion dollars. 
and I went to Amazon visiting Seattle a few, uh, two weeks ago, and when I saw Amazon, I mean, the growth of Amazon, I visited it 10 years ago, and uh, two weeks ago, it's incredible. It is unbelievable. Part of whole Seattle now is being, I mean, for those of you who have visited Seattle, you can look at what's happening there. And it is almost a trillion dollar company, and they have how many people? working in the field of AI, they have almost 1,800 people working in fields of AI and applied, uh, applied uh, and application. The same thing for Microsoft and other type of companies. For China, our friend spoke about Lenovo, which is one of the leaders in uh, the computational world. Lenovo, we have Tencent, we have Alibaba, we have Baidu. Each one of these companies, I mean, that are valued at 500 or 400 billion dollars each, and each one of them has a whole department of research in the f latest field of AI and application. And it's no wonder that these two companies, I mean, uh, these two countries, China and uh, North America in general, Canada and the US, are leading in this particular uh, world. Europe, Africa also is getting there. Hopefully, we will get there and we try to catch up. So these are some of the suggestions at the micro level, how we can do it. I'm not, all, again, a business person. I don't uh, relate to smart businesses and whatever, but I communicate with a number of companies throughout the year, and I have a number of, I mean, uh, suggestions here. So first of all, you need to anticipate the trend and strategize, whether it's a small, medium-sized, or large company, and acquire the resources early on. Resources could be human or monetary budget. Build AI, ML, machine learning clusters and centers with expertise in core areas of the business. If you are a business type of center, you build a center dedicated to the banking industry. Possibly a number of banks within one country, like Tunisia, or multi-banks could cooperate with each other. They put a research center in one of the African countries to create this particular uh, cluster of research and development and training as well. So uh, build data storage capabilities. The uh, gold mine, as our friend was mentioning earlier, data is gold nowadays, okay? And that's why Google is almost 600 billion, 700 billion dollars company because of the data that they have acquired to develop their speech engine or to have almost perfect speech uh, search, search engine now. That's because of the data and the data that they have uh, processed to create those type of engines. Increase business leaders' knowledge of advanced analytics to create demand. You need to, co uh, to convince leaders of companies on the benefits of the AI technologies. So this is no longer 10 years ago, 15 years ago. If you would like to catch up, you have to know exactly the state of the art and who are your competitors in the field in order to know how to rectify the problem and to go to the next level of sophistication in creating your product. Build a high performance te uh, team in the field of AI machine learning. This has been difficult to achieve by a number of companies. Why? Because this expertise suddenly has become very much demanded. And big companies are paying, I mean, very, very uh, large amount of money to attract these scientists, to attract these researchers. And those researchers have been attracted in the past 10 years by the large companies. So the small companies have suffered. But now things are changing. Why things are changing? Because now universities have caught up with these things through investment from companies and from government. How? I'm going to mention that in a few minutes because we can apply that as well for our countries in Tunisia or in Africa. Embed early on data and analytics in transformational and strategic initiatives. Data rich companies now are literally rich companies, as simple as that. So if you are able to utilize the data of your company, you utilize it in the benefit of your company, you are a winner. For the level of the macro perspective, the government, the public, and the private institutions have to invest now. Not tomorrow, not in one, one year or two years. You have to invest now, today, and bake in educating the masses and corporations on the benefit of AI. So this type of workshops, this type of events that are organized by DSI are excellent, excellent forums, I mean, for people to recognize the importance of AI for creating the smart enterprise and smart businesses. 
massively train students and professionals on the state of the art tools of AI and machine learning. In our university alone, we have created almost 20 courses over the past two years. We have designed 20 new courses that are attended by 4,000 students, undergraduate and graduate level. Why? Because these students that used to go to a particular area in whatever area that is not related to machine intelligence, now they would like to go and they would like to be trained in order for them when they apply for a company in their CV, they say that I am machine learning scientist. I am a researcher in this particular field. So this is becoming very, very important and I will speak about it in the later part of the presentation. Availability of large amount of public libraries and AI platforms at almost no cost. No, this is, I mean, uh, no, I would like to continue with this one. Tight cooperation involving industry and research institutions is of paramount importance to transfer knowledge on most recent findings. Why? These companies that would like to compete, let's say a major bank, I mean, from one day to the next, they find themselves competing with other type of banks that have researchers in the field. They are not able to hire a team of research scientists in the field of AI machine learning. So what they do, they do, they go to the universities. They say that I will give you an amount of funding and I would like you to solve this problem. I would like you to develop this software for me. I would like you to, me to help making intelligent decisions to support my case, to support my customers. And this is very, very important. Initiate workshops and seminars, to this one, at various industries and businesses to educate employees on benefits of AI and to form next generation leaders. Although I know that this forum is not dedicated to AI by itself, but in the future, possibly DSI could have specialized workshops, seminars in this field of AI in order to train its employees or other type of employees, and it could be paid type of workshops attended. Favorable environment for businesses and industries. This is why we are able to catch up. So the large corporations have now the ability to lead in becoming consumers uh, and providers of AI technology, simply because they have funding and simply because a lot of research scientists now are being trained and they could be recruited immediately by these companies. I noted that almost 10 of my students that I have trained over the past two years have received, each one of them, two to three offers from large companies because they are working in the field of AI, in the machine learning. So this is an excellent opportunity for large companies. Small companies are also benefiting. Why? Because the data now is becoming free, is accessible, and there is also access to AI platform that are inexpensive or sometimes completely free, and public libraries of AI and machine learning tools. These, public, uh, these libraries used to be like gold. You need to, uh, to develop an algorithm. 10 years ago or 12 years ago, my students requires possibly one full year to develop a good working algorithm. Now, with a click of a mouse, he's able to retrieve one of the best algorithms for classifier of a particular set of data. So this is becoming very, very easy, and small companies could benefit from this. Prototyping AI product doesn't require large equipment and expensive competition infrastructure, accessibility to the masses. To give you a small example, I was in this meeting in, uh, in Seattle, organized by Amazon. So Amazon has selected five companies from a competition of almost 1,000 companies from all over the world. They gave them funding, they gave them support, and they selected these five companies because they are promising in the field of AI. And they gave them funding to and location, uh, local to come and work, and to develop a prototype that might use the Alexa engine, the voice speech recognition system of Amazon. They came and they told them, after three months, you are going to provide us with the outcome. And I was attending this outcome as one member of the community of uh, this startup companies there. I was one of the consulting for one of the startup. And it was incredible what has happened within those three months. These companies presented their work, one of them for uh, e-grocery, uh, another one for, uh, for cooking, for e-cooking, I mean for, uh, for e-cooking, another one for interacting with games using speech, another one for online education and tutoring. And immediately after the presentations of these companies, each one of them is composed of four to six people. 
Funds between one million to five million dollars have been provided to these companies, and it did not require them a lot of preparation over other than the three months and mentorship within those particular areas, and no major infrastructure other than the cloud of Amazon, which we can have access to it as well in this part of the world. So to give you, I mean, how this is becoming very, very easy, or not very easy, but I mean, not as challenging as before for small businesses. So let me talk very briefly about the Waterloo AI Institute and why we have established it. So this AI Institute came from the demand of businesses, large and small. And they said that we don't have enough people to train, we don't have enough people in the field of AI and machine intelligence to, uh, to assist us. So they come, they say that we will fund you, we will provide you with, I mean, a uh, good, good amount of funding. So we have four major AI institutes nowadays in Canada. One of them is called Vector Institute, the other one is called Mila, another one is Eni, and the Waterloo AI, which I am directing at, uh, co-directing at the University of Waterloo. We have now 180 faculty members, professors in all fields, mathematics, uh, engineering, that are part of this AI institute, working in foundational and operational AI institute. They have their own position with their department, but they are also a member of the AI institutes. We have, this is a joint initiative between the two largest faculty of math and engineering in Canada, which is in, at the University of Waterloo. And uh, we have now 20 graduate and undergraduate courses have been mounted over the past few years in addition to other type of courses. And we have almost 4,000 4, students, undergraduate and graduate, taking these courses every year. So we are creating the generation of the future in this particular field. Every year now we are graduating more than 250 masters and PhD students in this particular area. Researchers also from uh, faculties uh, are part of this institute, Applied Health Sciences, Arts and Sciences. They are part of our institute as well. More than 12 million dollars of sponsorship have been committed and have been paid to students and researchers at this particular institute. And we fund with it research work by faculty members, and we have a number of activities which are in this, mentioned in this list. So what we are doing, besides I mean, uh, administrating this AI Institute, we do organize workshops and seminars in various areas of AI involving industrial partners, government, and research labs. So these are speeches given by professors, researchers in the field of AI. Attendees could be from the industry, from the academia. We have short courses with tutorials in pertinent field of machine learning and AI. So these courses are given to members of the companies that are sponsoring the institute. So one of them was held two weeks ago in the field of natural language understanding system. And managers and operational uh, directors come and attend these type of meetings along with their employees in the fields of AI. Short term and long term research projects from one year to four years uh, duration for these type of projects. We organize also uh, competitions, hackathons involving teams composed of faculty members and students. And we have one hackathon, such hackathon, that is being held now. It's one million dollar prize for any group of students and professors who are going to come with the best possible type of system that is able to detect fake news from real news. And co-sponsoring of established technical events, conferences, workshops, invited talks, and congresses. We have organized over the past two years more than six such international events using the AI institutes. To conclude, I would like to speak about the challenges and the risks. So not everything is rosy. AI is there. Machine learning is there. It is still in its infancy. A lot of things could be progressed. and. Uh, Large businesses could benefit more than smaller businesses. This is an issue. And uh, many theoreticians, many people who are in the field of AI are trying to reach the level of the human intelligence or mimic the level of the human intelligence. As uh, uh, Si Ayad yesterday mentioned, so there is this technological singularity. Is it a good thing? Some people are saying that it might be good up to a certain type of uh, level. Deep learning algorithms have one of the major issues. They are not transparent, they are not explainable. 
this is a major issue for a number of companies in the health sector and in the banking sector. They would like to see what is happening within the connectionist model. Uh, major issues concerning trust in AI, fairness and bias in machine learning. That was a question that was posed to our colleague earlier. How do you trust this particular system? So there is a major issue there. The bias in the Google type of example that was provided by one of the attendees. More funding is required for AI for social good and long-term benefits. So uh, finally, I mean, uh, no, this is the same sentence. So I would like to thank all my students and researchers in my research lab who are working with me uh, in this particular type of uh, project and my email there. If any one of you have any question or anything to follow up, I would be happy to communicate with them. And this is one last picture of our campus at the University of Waterloo. And you are welcome to visit me anytime you are in the neighborhood of Toronto or Waterloo area. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Fakhri Karai, for sharing all this uh, precious information with us. Uh, we are really thankful for, for that. Uh, is there any question? Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes. We have two teams, actually, two of our research team that have received some amounts from, uh, from actually Microsoft to work on the explainable AI. And we have a team that has been able to create a deep learning within deep learning. So a system that is able to go to convolve it, uh, itself and check the convolution of the system, whether it is beneficial or not to the, to the model. And this type of engines that you can put in the deep learning system could go to every part of the deep neural network and give you a certain type of assessment on its strength or in, on its weight in terms of what it gives you in the form of the output, whether it's accurate or not accurate. Yes, yes, you need to have a new type of architecture for this particular... Yeah, so this is a group that has been doing the research, but I was, I'm also part of one of the co-supervision of this type of students. So what we do, we take these type of layers for the deep learning, I don't want to go all over the details, and there is a metric of assignments for the best possible features that the system has uh, captured. And you go through several type of loops, and for the type of the final results, for the accurate type of results, for labels that you know that has been already classified for which you know the results, the system will give you a certain type of metric, whether that layer has given you the best possible outcome or not. So you take one layer, you deal with it, and then you keep the remaining, I mean, in touch. And then you go one by one. And then you try to see what is the best possible type of configuration. Thank you. Another question? Yeah. Yes, please. Thank you. There is part of it correct. There is part. Yes. Uh, there is no microphone, so I'll, I'll just try, try to repeat the question uh, with the microphone. Do you think that uh, oh, yeah, the country will control the, the eye? So what he's saying, uh, I mean, uh, do you think the, uh, that countries that control AI, machine learning, similar yes. to what the countries that we have mentioned, will control the world? In truth, almost. I, I would say almost. But it's not a lost. Excuse me? Yes, USA and China are going to be the leaders. I mean, that's, that's a fact. Now they are the leaders, and the trend is going into that direction because of the research centers and the money that is being deployed with these two countries, it's enormous. We cannot imagine the amount of money that these major companies, actually, not only the governments, major companies, I mean, such as Google, Amazon, Microsoft, are putting, is incredible. You cannot imagine that they are putting budgets but, of the billions of dollars. But are you still Mr. talking about countries or companies? I think, do, do you so, think that so, companies can be, in the future, or could be, uh, stronger than countries? Uh, I don't know about that. I mean, if you say Microsoft is going to be stronger than the U.S., I don't agree with don't that. Yeah. But in other countries, I mean, companies are always, I mean, small size type of companies. But these are giants are going to remain giants because they control the data. They Obviously. have access to the data. Obviously, and the yeah.
you mean GDP, uh, the GDP you mean? The GDP of countries you mean? Is it going to? No, I did not understand your question. So what, what is, oh, so can you, what is GDPR, please, yeah. Yes, okay, yeah, so, so yeah, <laughs> yeah, okay. So data privacy and uh, cyber security and uh, is one of the major issues for the evolving of, uh, of, uh, of AI, it's true. However, what's happening now, they are working hand in hand. So uh, Google, for instance, has established, I mean, they have one of the largest center in AI, but now they have established a cyber security system, Facebook the one of the top, I mean, uh, users and providers of AI, they are creating their Libra type of, the equivalent of their Bitcoin system. Why? Because they have a whole team working on uh, blockchain and on the cybersecurity. So these type of companies know the impact of the privacy for the type of data. So yes, for small companies, sometimes the data, you are not able to capture it from hospitals. I mean, I know a number of companies that they have a lot of money but they are not able to get the, 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 the data. They say the hospital or the major hospital, they say, unless you have a certain type of link that is private and uh, encrypted, we are not going to provide you the data. Do you think there is a race about uh, new currencies? Yes, yes, if, if, yeah. I mean, two, two days ago, I don't know if you have heard of it, I'm sure that many of you heard of it, but uh, China has approved the usage of I mean, the cryptocurrency. So that was two days ago, or one day ago, almost. So the president of China has approved that. Venezuela too, but it wasn't so successful, huh? Yeah, and immediately Bitcoin, I mean, went to almost 20% to 25%. And Libra, which is the cryptocurrency of Facebook, has seen a renewed life in it. And they are very, very happy because of what China has done. So there is a major, I mean, competition there as well. Thank you so much. Thank you Merci so d'avoir été de notre. Merci pour tous ces éclairages. Encore une fois, un grand bravo à Fakhri Karay, magnifique ambassadeur justement de l'intelligence et du savoir-faire.